Hey everybody, Patrick here, and today we're going to do another Zoom interview with one of the scientists we work with through our Advocate Apparel program. Today we're going to talk with Dr. Mariana Fuentes. She's the lead scientist at uh, the lab at Florida State University that studies marine turtles. So we're going to hop on the Zoom here, and I thought you guys could come and join us and learn anything and everything having to do with sea turtles. Let's check it out. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on this Zoom chat. I have the honor and privilege to have Dr. Mariana Fuentes from Florida State University, the Marine Turtle Research Group with us. Mariana, thank you so much time, for taking time out of your very busy schedule uh, to chat with us about sea turtles today. Thank you so much, Patrick, for having me. It's a, a pleasure to be here today. Awesome. So we, people know how we do this. We have five questions and we just roll right into them. Some of them a little easier, some of them a little bit trickier. Try to ask you some difficult ones. First question is, uh, we have a lot of people, a lot of customers that are super passionate about sea turtles. They Maybe they're high school students and they want to get into sea turtle research. They want to understand how they can become you know, a sea turtle, either a citizen scientist or do it, studying them in, in school. Could you tell me a little bit about how you got into, what was your pathway to get into studying um, sea turtles? And could you tell us a little bit about what you do specifically at Florida State and the Florida State program? Certainly. So I actually became a sea turtle scientist by chance. I always knew that I wanted to work with animals and eventually I decided to become a marine biologist. But it wasn't until I was in my first year of uh, university that I had the opportunity to conduct an internship at a Projeto Tamar, which is a sea turtle conservation group in Brazil that I actually became fascinated uh, by sea turtles. So after that, I tried to become as involved as I could with different sea turtle projects. And I had the, the opportunity to work with different projects in Australia. And eventually I did my master's and PhD uh, working with sea turtles. So basically one thing led to another. And every project that I worked with sea turtles, I became more and more fascinated by them. And I guess my concerns about their survivorship and their future increased. So that's how I decided to develop a research program that would provide science-based solution for the conservation and management of sea turtles. So now at Florida State University, our group aims to provide science-based solution for uh, different questions, uh, management and conservation questions related to sea turtles. And a lot of our research is applied where we try to provide information for managers and conservationists on um, how to best manage sea turtles. So we are interested in projects that better understand the spatial ecology of sea turtles, but also the exposure of sea turtles to different impacts. So right now, most of our projects are focusing on better understanding the impacts of vessel strike, coastal development, and climate change on sea turtles, and to provide guidance on how to mitigate those threats. That's, a, that's really a broad amount of work. Uh, it's an amazing scope of work. Um, kind of thinking about when you, you were saying one thing kind of led to another. Um, when you're looking at student candidates and people that are coming up through high school, um, what are the kind of things you look for out of um, a potential student? If there's students out there that are in middle school and high school and they want to start developing maybe the skills that will enable them to kind of take that one step to the other. Do you have any tips for kind of up and coming scientists and ways they can kind of develop themselves? I think just get involved, right? Um, I think it's important to get an understanding of what you like to do and what you don't like to do. And obviously um, volunteering or conducting internships will provide the skill sets and an understanding of what might be that you might want to do in the future. So I think it's very glamorous to think about being a marine biologist and being in the boat out all day. But the reality we all know is that the amount of time that we actually spend out in the water, it's very small relative to the amount of time that you spend in front of the computer. So I think it's, it's good to get an understanding of the different paths that you might have within a career. So obviously I'm in academia working at a university. So I do spend more time in front of the computer there's other opportunities and other paths that can provide 
different ways for you to be making a difference. I think that's wonderful advice. And I, I know with like the Instagram culture and sort of the way that marine biology and research in general can sometimes be presented, including us. I mean, we post all, <laughs> all the time. It, it can sometimes seem that you're just out in the sun all the time, but there's a lot of time. I wish. <laughs> right? There's a lot of time on MATLAB and Excel and, and computers. So I think that's really good advice. Um, so my second question, I've been reading some articles in the news that were talking about how in 2020, there was such a reduction in the amount of tourism coming to Florida beaches that there was sort of this hypothesis that there was going to be like a sea turtle boom um, from increased nesting rates because there was less human, um, I guess, disturbance from the beaches. Um, is that true? Are you guys finding that did 2020 and, and humans being stuck at home, did was there any benefit, do you think, um, towards sea turtle populations, at least here in Florida? I think this is a great question, and it's one that makes us think about the information that we're hearing and the data, right? So first, I think it's important to think about the biology of sea turtles. So when we think about the factors that might influence when a sea turtle is ready to nest, basically we're looking at what's happening at their foraging grounds. So the availability and the quality of food their foraging grounds will pretty much determine whether they're ready or not to nest. So basically when the pandemic hit, it was already determined when turtles would be nesting or not. So I don't think, I think it's really hard to look at the links on nesting numbers versus the pandemic. But obviously uh, one thing that we can consider is the disturbance at a beach level. So obviously when a turtle comes on, on land to nest, they can be faced with an array of different disturbances from humans, you know, from pollution, um, including just things that are left on the beach from light pollution and, and humans just directly disturbing turtles. So the less people that we have at a beach, the less disturbance that we might have. Uh, if we think of Florida beaches, for example, we have to remember that the beaches were actually open. <laughs> during the nesting season. So they opened before the nesting season started. So, but I do think there was a reduction in the number of people out on the beach. So if anything, I think the disturbance level might have been uh, smaller than usual, but it's really hard to relate that to actual nesting number. So we might have seen uh, less false crawls, which is when the turtle comes to nest and they encounter an obstacle or something, and then they go back to the beach. Um, I think that the disturbance or the impacts or the benefits from the pandemic on sea turtles might have been different in developing countries where, for example, poaching is a big issue. So the reduction of law enforcement or people on the beach might have actually increased the opportunity for poaching and um, other impacts at a, a nesting beach level. So, I, so it's important to think at particular sites and uh, on specific situations and how the pandemic might have affected an area or a species. So hard to say, basically. Yeah, I mean, it's like anything, there's always uh, two sides to it. Um, I think the conversation is a great lead into my third question, um, which is, you know, a lot of people around the world, um, especially here in the US, are kind of trying to get back to normal life, so to speak. Um, a lot more people going to the beach, a lot more people going on the water. As people kind of get back to that, um, you know, trying to find regular life and spend more time at the beach, what are some things they can do um, to be mindful about sea turtles? So there are little actions and just awareness things that they can do when they go back to the coast to help sea turtles out? So the good news is that there's a lot of easy things that can be done to help sea turtles. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, one can aim to reduce the amount of rubbish and debris that they produce and the use of plastic, as plastic and debris can end up in the ocean and sea turtles can end up getting tangled or they can uh, mistake debris for food. Similarly, uh, people can re, uh, refrain from releasing balloons. Um, similarly to marine debris that can end up in the ocean and sea turtles can end up eating uh, the balloons. Um, if you're fortunate enough to be at a sea turtle nesting beach, you can um, 
ensure that sea turtle nesting beaches are safe and dark for sea turtles. So light will cause disorientation of hatchlings and may impede nesting by female sea turtles. So if you are at sea turtle nesting beach, make, make sure to put your lights off at night when sea turtles come to lay their eggs. And also if you do have to have lights on, make sure that you use sea turtle lights, uh, friendly lights. Um, leave no trace. If you're at a nesting beach, make sure that you don't leave your recreational beach furniture out because that can be an obstacle for sea turtles and hatchlings. If you're out boating um, and you know that this is an area that you often see sea turtles, make sure that you keep your eye out for sea turtles and stop when you see a turtle. If you're fishing, make sure that you don't leave any of the hooks or lines or nets um, out and make sure that you recycle and dispose them properly so sea turtles don't end up getting entangled on those items. And similarly, if you're fishing and you see a sea turtle, um, stop fishing and go fish elsewhere. So those are just a little, little things and modifications that you can do, whether you're in a boat or at a nesting ground or in your day-to-day -day that will make a huge difference for sea turtles. Great tips, really great tips. A lot of common sense tips. And, and I think often there is um, sometimes the feeling that the common sense stuff maybe isn't all that important, but when it's aggregated over a lot of people, um, I'm sure you've seen in your work you know, sea turtles that are caught up in marine debris or, um, you know, eat a balloon thinking it's a jellyfish. And, you know, you're, you're on the front lines seeing this stuff in your research. Um, all of the small things add up, wouldn't you agree? Oh, certainly. If you think, well, I'll just leave my beach chair out. But if everyone does that, then it's a huge impact for turtles. So everyone can certainly make a difference and that difference is cumulative, like you said. So it's worth to think about your broad impact, even though you can't see it, the big picture. I love it. Uh, so my fourth question, as, as you know, as our customers know, 10% of profits from our sea turtle inspired products, including our new water bottles, awesome. uh, will help you um, do exactly what Dr. Fuentes is talking about using less single use plastic. 10% um, of profits we donate to your lab. Could you tell us a little bit um, how you use those funds and, um, and what you use them for in your lab, just so our customers can sort of know what they're supporting? Mm -hmm. So first of all, we're extremely fortunate to have the support from Waterlust. And the support really allows us to be flexible and innovative on the way that we conduct research. Because Basically, there's no strings attached like a, a typical grant that we might receive from federal and state funding. We basically can use the funding as we want, which means that we can do some really cool science with that money. So the support that we have received to us with two particular projects. The first one is uh, focusing on understanding the impacts of recreational fisheries and human interactions um, on sea turtles in the Florida Panhandle. So we focus a lot of our work in Crystal River, especially during the scallop season. So we're interested in understanding the impacts of um, scalloping on sea turtles and also how sea turtles might react to having more, more boats and more people in the water. So as a matter of fact, next week, we're going to use some of the support from Waterlust to actually try some uh, new cameras that we're going to be deploying on sea turtles to get a better view of um, how turtles are interacting with the environment and to see if there's modifications or any things that can be changed to mitigate um, the negative impact of interaction. So we're really looking forward to this uh, next trip coming up. And the second project that we have used support from Waterlust is focused at a sea turtle nesting ground in the Florida Panhandle as well. And it's one of the most important um, nesting grounds for the Gulf of Mexico loggerhead recovery unit. It's St. George Island. And basically for this project, we're interested in looking at, um, again, the interactions of sea turtles with humans and in particularly impacts from coastal development and climate change and sea turtles. So the fundings from Waterlust has allowed us this year to continue our monitoring efforts because unfortunately we haven't been able to secure long-term funding 
for that project. So hopefully that will be the support coming from Waterloo that will allow us to continue this work at St. George Island. It's amazing. I really, I appreciate that update. And I think it's, um, it's a common theme that we hear with a lot of the researchers. And I think something that people may not be aware of is a lot of times the, the funding like you're describing, um, it's really restrictive. And you might have an idea, um, something innovative that you want to experiment with. Um, but oftentimes grants really won't give you money to be exper you know, experimenting and um, trying new things. And then that kind of reduces innovation. So uh, we're really excited that our funding can be used flexibly and you can do it, um, use it however you think makes sense. So I'm really excited to hear, uh, to hear you using it in that way. Um, so our final question is, is by far the most difficult one. Uh, and I've asked this to other to other scientists and working with different species, but it's sort of hypothetical. Um, if you could kind of, you know, wave your magic wand and have the company of like all the major world leaders and you could influence a, you know, changes in policy that you think would help on behalf of sea turtles. Um, you know, you don't have to be specific, but what kind of things do you think like on behalf of humanity, do you think we could be doing better um, from a policy and enforcement perspective? So certainly this is a very tricky question. And I think we really have to think about the geographic location that is being considered, right? But generally I would be looking at policy changes that would maximize conservation outputs by minimizing interactions with humans and also mitigating the impacts from exposure. Because sometimes you can't really totally mitigate um, the exposure of sea turtles or other species to a certain um, disturbance or human activity. So for example, I think if you're thinking about mitigating impacts, uh, one could consider implementing uh, sea turtle friendly lives to all sea turtle nesting grounds. Or one could think about the use of sea turtle excluded devices in all shrimp trawling vessels. But I think ultimately when we're thinking about policy and conservation interventions, not only we have to think about sea turtles, but we also have to think about, think about the stakeholders that are involved and might be affected by uh, the different conservation initiatives. So it's finding that balance between the environment and development and society. So if I did have that magic power, um, I would certainly be considering a holistic approach to changing some of the policies that exist to maximize uh, conservation while thinking about society as well. I don't think you could have answered that any better. <laughs> if there ever were, I dodged a bullet. I think. I think if you ever were, ever were to have a global sea turtle czar position, I would <laughs> totally vote for you to do it because I think uh, your perspective is spot on. I would take it. <laughs> um, well, Dr. Fuentes, thank you so much um, for joining us today. You learned a lot, super fascinating. And it sounds like maybe we should we should do a follow-up with that camera and find out how your camera stuff go, goes. I'm sure people would be really excited to, to learn how that experimental um, work is going. So hopefully we can uh, you know, maybe do a, a follow-up in a year or so and see how it's all going. Certainly, uh, we are looking forward to deploying those cameras. Um, there hasn't been many projects that have actually deployed cameras on mature loggerhead turtles. So we're hoping for some exciting footage and I'm happy to share or do a follow-up um, in the future. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining us today. And uh, I'll put links down below if you wanna um, support Dr. Fuentes' lab, learn more about it. Um, but thank you all for joining. And uh, thanks again, Dr. Fuentes, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And thanks for the support.